This episode of Outdoor Journal Radio is brought to you in part by the Invasive Species Center, protecting Canada's land and water from invasive species, and SAIL, the ultimate destination for your outdoor adventures. Hey everybody, <laughs> we're live. Uh, we're live. <laughs> Welcome to the Outdoor Journal Radio Podcast on the Outdoor Journal Radio Podcast Network. And we are, this is basically what we call, to the people that are sitting here in front of us, uh, an on the road again experience so we do these uh basically we do these podcasts from on location we try to do a podcast a week uh, at home if we're not home like this stint is going to be a three-week stint for us in the east coast of canada and so we have to do three podcasts basically out on the road and that so this is going to be one of them right here and we are at minnow well how, what's the name of the minnow tackle shop minnow tackle shop okay yeah, minnow tackle in shop. fredericton new brunswick that voice you just heard there i'm going to try and get this right was Pierre Olivier Blah. Blah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How do you say it, buddy? Right say, right. say it break fully in French, like that. Pierre Olivier Blah. Pierre Olivier Blah. Don't okay. worry about the accent. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> good. Beautiful, man. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Je ne parle français un peu tout. Oui? No, and put deeper. I started. I, I, I tried. Hey, hey, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. We went into the coffee shop. We're driving through. Uh, uh, from Ontario to New Brunswick, obviously we have to go through no, Quebec. Quebec. Yeah, so yeah. we have to go through Quebec. So we go to Quebec, and we've always had a hard time ordering even something as simple as coffees. So, uh, and this experience was great because they spoke fantastic English. They welcomed us with open arms and all the Tim Hortons. But we went into one, and we and I said to Stevie, "I said Stevie, try to order your coffee in French for us, please." And so, how did you do? Here? Well, I I grew up in Ontario, so I took French in public school right from you know grade one to grade eight. So I felt that I did a pretty good job. You did a great job. I said, eh, noir cafe. <laughs> and, the, and, Peter, <laughs> and somebody hey, said, good. how big do you want it? I said, petit peu. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got lady, a small, I got a small black coffee. Oh, she was laughing at yeah. it. She thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, so that's fun. right. So that's right. Anyways, as people can tell uh, that are listening or watching, we are in uh, Fredericton, uh, New Brunswick, and we we come to New Brunswick quite a bit. Um, and the, for the Fishing Canada show, and for obviously good reasons. The fishing here is absolutely amazing. The people here are absolutely amazing. Everything is a plus when you come here. So, um, and what we did in this, in this, we're on a three shoot trip. So this one is New Brunswick. We're going to Nova Scotia, then we're coming back to New Brunswick. On this shoot, on this one here, right here in New Brunswick, we want to do a, do, do a multi-species shoot. And, uh, and that we thought, let's try and do as many as we can. It's gonna be a, a tall task because our show is basically bre broken up into three or four blocks. And if we have four or five or six species, we don't even know how, to, how we're gonna edit this thing. But, but the thing we wanted to do was largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, muskie, striper, and a sturgeon. And so far, uh, with the help of Pierre, we got the sturgeon done, the smallmouth done, and the stripers done so far. And we're, we got a day left to try and get my musky and largemouth. I don't know if we're gonna get them both or not, but that's our plan. So maybe Pierre, you can uh, tell everybody kind of what we did uh, you know, from start to finish. We started on the sturgeon, so let's start with the sturgeon stuff. Yes, yeah, so basically Pete, we basically started down in uh, Fredericton, a popular spot for sturgeon. Um, right in the morning, first species, it didn't, it didn't take us too, too long to get our first two, not, eh? Not at all. Um, not at all. But then after that, after we got our two sturgeon, we got one decent size one then right to start. And then the uh, second one was a little smaller, but still a beautiful fish. It and took longer to teach Nick not to set the hook on a circle hook than it did to catch the sturgeon. <laughs> it, it really did. <laughs> it did or, 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 <laughs> or him to not move the rod. When it was and him to not move the rod. Yeah. Is anybody, have everybody here sturgeon fished? Has everybody tried it? It's quite a, it's quite a little different setup than uh, casting for bass and setting the hook and stuff like that, right? So yeah, go ahead there, so. But yeah, yeah, we got our sturgeon and then after that we hit some smallies and uh, we tried a few spots, it was pretty good. We had a pretty was, good day it actually It was quick, that day. Yeah, the smallies were yeah. quick. We got onto them on those little rock piles and there's all kinds of little rock piles in the river. Yeah. And uh, and uh, one of the little tips we can give you, uh, if, you're fish, if you're fishing these little rock piles, rock weed piles, what happened, it's a typical pattern on any body of water. If the rock pile is sitting this way, 
front and back and the river's flowing this way, usually that front tip of the rock pile is where you're gonna get most of your fish. You throw that first, your cast right to that front of that little thing, especially if there's weeds on it. It didn't matter if we threw a crank bait to it, threw a worm to it, threw a, a jerk bait to it. If you got it close to that weed, we, we got cracked real quick. Yeah, right? we, they, they were on that day. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Uh, yeah, second day we tried for mosque right in the morning. I mean, we marked a few. I think you guys had a little bit of a follow there. On we a, had one, so we're, we're running live scope right now. Yep. And well, Stevie, you can tell that one. You can tell that story. Well, the live scope is um, is is an amazing technology. And for those of you who don't know exactly what live scope is, there's the older technology, which is your traditional sonar, and that sonar basically, as your your page scrolls, you're looking at the past. So those fish and those hooks that are scrolling across your screen happened back there. The live scope is a forward facing sonar that gives you a picture of what's happening in real time. So what we were doing, we turned and, and we have the luxury to have uh, two separate units on, uh, on the boat with two transducers. We turned them backwards so that when we were trolling for our uh, trolling for muskies, there's no more line counters. You don't need line counters anymore because we can throw those musky baits out in the back on the side and watch those baits behind the boat swim. And you can actually see the movement of that bait and, and uh, the, the depth in which it, that it drops. So it's very easy to, to see a school of bait fish at 15 feet and 30 feet and then watch your bait go down to them, spin around and hit those areas again. And the other very cool thing, and it is something that happened to us at that point, we were doing this, watching our baits, and we had either a big uh, striper or musky, because it's very difficult to differentiate on the live scope uh, between species. But size is, is pretty easy. And we had a big fish come right up to our bait, follow the bait, right? And it's like buck fever almost, or video game fishing. I was behind the, uh, the wheel and uh, I was watching this muskie following my bait. I'm assuming it was a muskie, could have been a big striper, but at the end of the day, I don't care. <laughs> I wanna catch it. And uh, I watched it and Peter, he saw it as well from the screen on the front. He said, look at that fish. I said, I know, I know. And uh, I slowed down. And a lot of times, you know, that either speed up, slow down, turn, it'll trigger a strike. But that day, I learned slowing down is not what you want to do. <laughs> so I slowed down a little bit. And that fish, we saw him peel away, and then that was it. So, yeah, and that's that's a learning thing for people mm -hmm. that are if you're using live sonar. It's, it's expensive. We know we get that it's expensive, but it's a it's a whole learning thing. So we know that if there's another fish that comes in and follows us, we are not slowing that's down. That's right. Either speed. We're gonna wait till he stops. If he's if he stays on that bait, stay on it. Just stay just stay steady. If he's gonna follow, but if he you know he starts to wander out a bit, maybe crack the throttle forward or turn left or right, like Steve said. So. Um, but the technology is absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. Ridiculous. We're, we're using forward view in, in, in reverse. We're shooting backwards. Now, now, this stuff is so clear. Pierre here makes a, what do you call your little weed guy? guy the weed thing? guard. What do you call oh, yeah, that? The, 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 it's just a weed guard you put on top of your leader. It's a yeah. weed guard that you put, so at the head of your leader, let's say you got a 14, 16 inch leader or whatever, and it's all that heavy musky in it, then you got a, a swivel or, or split ring, whatever it is, but he puts a little weed catcher on the front of that leader. Looks like the plug out of a shotgun shell it, but it's facing tiny, up. But it's the, my point is it's so small and we can literally see that on the live scope all the time. We knew we just, when we, we were carrying in, weeds. You knew you could see you could see carrying weeds and all that stuff. So that's how accurate this stuff you know can be. You dial it in properly. Um, and then the, <clears throat> you know the the settings there's you play with that stuff every day because it's different every day sort of thing so uh, that was cool and then we went on to stripers and uh, where'd we go there bud yeah stripers i mean uh we started the night around what was it seven o'clock i think we started it, the yes, night. It, yeah, um, but, yeah. right before the sun went down uh we had we had a couple hits we got two small little stripers um and then uh, one one that really peeled the drag yeah um the hook opened sadly but uh it was definitely a big fish i mean uh, how, how how loud was that drag that was that so that's uh, for those of you have you ever if you're running musky guys will do this a lot striper guys big fish fishermen do this a lot as they run their their uh, trolling rigs on with clickers on 
And the clicker is, uh, is not just for, it basically, it's to tell you that, hey, you got a fish because you're not always looking at your line, you're not always watching and all that stuff. So when you snag the bottom with the clicker on your uh, trolling rod, it's just, it's just a steady pull. Well, this was just like that, except for like that. And that was, that's how you know it was a oh, giant Oh, she fish, ran, right? she ran pretty good. Uh, <laughs> it was, but uh, It was big. You should you have seen uh, Dean's face after that. Oh, when he Dean. That, uh, Dean over there, he's the guy that had uh, the unfortunate, he got the two fish, but he, that one got off and you could just see the disappointment in his face. He wanted a big striper. So, um, and that was very cool. And that, that's on the, on the St. John, right? On the, on the river? Yep. Yeah, right on the yeah. St. John River. They're uh, dark. Yeah, um, and yeah. it's very cool like, to, to be able to, to fish at dark again. We ran our navigation lights on and all like that, but we ran our live scopes and all that. We watched the, you know, we watched those spots. Pierre knows this spot intimately, so he, he had us, I got to go out here with the trolling, I got to go back in here like that, I got to go on this point like that, and we had it dialed right in, so. And you um, never deviated too far off that path, did you? No, never, never, yeah. and we still hooked fish. I oh, mean, yeah. uh, that big yeah. one there, I was literally, we just got one, and then uh, I put one rod back in, and uh, then I was putting the other one in, and then as I was doing that, it went off. Um, that one was a little bit off path, but uh, that, that was uh, some crazy. There you, you go. Know, there you know, was only so a few that. boats out. There was the, the good thing about that. It was only a few boats that were competing with us. You knew all the guys out there, yep. and it was good, right? They all. I think one guy got a, a couple of fish. He got a twenty nine inch or something. Yeah, like that, so right? yeah, one of, so, one of the guys down there got a nice one there. But uh, yeah, no, it was a great night. Uh, the fish were on. Definitely, they were on. But uh, how many fish did you see on the live scope come up to the lures? Oh my God! Now we're talking Stevie's story. We saw it every <laughs> every pass. We saw a striper come up, and like and that's something that's, that you you could take note of um, people that don't run live sonar or whatever like that. You would not believe the amount of fish that come up and look at your lure and turn away. It is absolutely insane. We're thinking, ah, the fishing's horrible. It sucks. It's no good here and all that. Uh, you know what? You, you have no idea how many fish, especially when you're trolling, that come up and take a look, you know. And, and that's where guys like Pierre and Steve's a musky guy, where they will change baits. They see that fish come up. He turns away. Okay, I gotta change the color. This guy's nuts. He he changes uh, like on a constant basis, size, color, you know, the wobble, depth, like that. He just like okay, he didn't like it, so he moved so many times like that. So and that's that's the sign of a good guide right there. So. And at the end of the day, they they ate the bait. Yeah. Yeah. And you found that one. He all three bites were on the same bait, right? On that one bait yeah. there. Yeah. We so, put that one bait. We started. Do you want to tell the, everybody what it was? Yeah, sure. It was an eight-inch <laughs> Jake. The most. Uh, I mean, it's a popular bait for anything really. But I do have this one specific Jake that uh, definitely catches fish. I think we ran a, a different one. because On we, the other side, it didn't do anything. Yeah, we right? had to change the hook on one of them at yeah. some point. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, it was uh, awesome. Has anybody in the audience got any questions uh, about the fishery around here, especially with Pierre up here? It's going to be, you got a great opportunity with a, a fishing guide, and then Stevie and I can sort of throw in our two cents of that. Is anybody? Yes, Mr. Wu. Okay, uh, the Ben's question, because they won't be able to hear it, is what is the ideal speed of trolling for stripers? Good question, Ben. Um, I actually change it up quite a bit. Um, sometime in the fall, like in the fall, I'll be running definitely slower. But then in the spring, I'll run a little faster. I mean, if you look at yesterday, we're running, we're trolling with a 250, right? So we're running basic at three, three, five miles an hour, which is a little faster than what I'm used to. Um, but typically, I'd be running like two, 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 five, not more than that. Uh, but it also depends on the bait that you're using. That's uh, talking crankwise. Um, eels or stuff like that, I'll be running way slower than that. There you go. Anybody else got questions? Now, I'll, I'll ask, ask uh, upon Ben's question. So let's say that was here in uh, September. What about November? Is there a change that you have to slow down the colder the water gets, or is it just it doesn't matter? There's still yeah. rippers. No, I, I, I'd i probably run as slow as possible, like two, one, two, two. Okay. Like two, two miles an hour. I mean, that's the slowest the boat will be able to go. But uh, with eels, I'll be, I've will be i been trying with the trolling motor to go like one, five, one, six. Even. Just dragging them along. Yeah, exactly. So that tail is just, yeah. okay. Just and right then he's on. using artificial eels, right? Not yeah, obviously, yeah, not exactly. live eels. Yeah, big eels. Uh, water temperature. What's the coldest water temperature you've ever caught a striper in? What are you guys? I uh, think it was like 40, 44, 45, I think is what the slowest one. Okay. Yeah. 44. And this, and this water, will, will it, it doesn't freeze in the river, does it? It does freeze. Does yeah. it freeze? Yep. So it'll yep. get in the 39 to 40 degrees sort of thing. Right? Oh, we'll get down I'll, to that. Well, I'll be fishing musky till about 30 degrees. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Any other questions? Anybody got anything? There you go. 
What is oh, the best bait as a guide uh, on the St. John River? And I'm going to give you a second uh, shot because there's another guide here on the uh, Ontario side of it. So best bait for muskie. We'll I think the, both me and Steve can agree on the same thing. It's, there's no specific bait, but we all have that one bait, right? That one bait that works for us. It doesn't matter if you have 10 copies of that one bait. You'll find the one that's got the special action, and that one is going to be the one. Um, I gave Steve the, my, uh, my baby as I call him and, and, uh, he yeah. wouldn't run it. No, I no, wouldn't. we didn't run it. Tell not, us, you got to tell the chance. story to that bait. You have to tell everybody else. Yeah, That's why so you didn't the, run it. The Cosmo, uh, it's a Cosmo. It's a, it's a custom bait. I mean, uh, actually, believe it or not, I bought it from Jason in the crowd, uh, probably, what was it? Two years, two, two something years ago. Um, and he wouldn't run it. And then I actually bought it off of him and then it's Can been we say the price tag of that bait? Oh, it's expensive. It's definitely in the hundreds of dollars, hundred and some dollars. <laughs> okay. But uh, it's been catching so many fish. I mean, it caught a 48 and a half this year. Um, it caught, a, it's just been hammered fish. Is it Cosmo, is it a, a custom, do you say a custom yep, bait? it's or a custom it? bait, okay. yeah. yeah. It's a guy from Quebec that makes them. Okay. Yep. Okay, and but, that's the reason, but you lost the bait, right? Didn't you? Uh, is that the oh, one you no, lost? not that one. That's not oh, the I one. Oh, I thought that was the one you lost no, and got back. Okay. No, that other one is actually a Brunswick bait. That one is made locally here in New Brunswick. Okay. It's made in Moncton uh, from Jeremy from Brunswick Baits. Your baits are tough, man. Um, basically, in June, I uh, got it hooked to a rope, and then uh, my buddy Jason there last week actually hooked the bait, and then I got it back to my hands, and it smells <laughs> like the St. John River now. So <laughs> I, I run that one. The action is killer on that bait. I mean, I've ran that bait a little bit, but it's already caught fish. I mean, I'm ready to put it back in the water now. Okay, Stevie, let's take an Ontario side. Steve uh, used to own a lodge on the French River. Uh, in Ontario, it, it, yeah. it joins Lake Nipissing to Georgian Bay. So, Stevie, a musky, your favorite, if you have a favorite musky bait. Oh, I absolutely do. I have a favorite musky bait. And again, like Pierre was saying, um, there's different baits that you can go through. And um, there's one one bait maker, he's a custom bait maker, his name's Paul Fisterio, and he makes Boss Shad baits. And we've found that the bait that runs true, um, but kicks out every once in a while. So that bait will run true as we're driving and you like to be able to drive. We don't go up to five mile an hour, but we do go up to four and a half uh, in certain conditions. And that's fast, right? And, and that's, most that's fast. That's fast um, but for that bait to run true or, and then kick out the side and then come back to true and then kick the other way and come back to true, that is really one of the key things that we look for. And it's like the, we were talking earlier, where when you can alter the, the, the speed, the, the, the direction, uh, whatever, those baits that kick out, that, the, those muskies follow, 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 and all of a sudden it kicks out and that can trigger a strike. But that's not my favorite bait. <laughs> my favorite bait, honestly, and for whatever reason in the last... 10 years, it doesn't matter what I run. Paul's Boss Shads, um, uh, Shadzillas, which are big plastic baits, uh, spin spinners. My favorite bait is a drifter tackle stalker, jointed stalker. And that bait is like 20 bucks. I bought it for 20 bucks. And you can, and it's in Fire Tiger. And this bait, um, for whatever reason, we call it a knocker. We call this bait a knocker because I have the same stalker, jointed, fire tiger, walleye, whatever color it is. And I can run all four, all, I can run four lines. And that bait is the one that catches 80% of the time. And uh, the other thing, the other caveat that I will add to that is your confidence adds a ton to how successful that bait is. Because if you catch on a bait, what bait are you gonna put back out there first? Bait. That bait. How long are you gonna leave it in the water? Longer than the others, right? So confidence in a bait affects whether you, how successful you are with it, typically because you always give that guy a little extra time in the water. But my favorite bait, is a drifter uh, jointed 
stalker in fire tiger so what makes these bait, i've been hearing both you guys say the same thing one particular bait it could be 30 sitting on this table here the exact same bait and there's one that's going to be the killer what does it, what is it that makes that bait do that for muskies i think it's the kick to the side i mean that's pretty magical on certain well it could, it could be but i don't know uh, like, I mean, I don't know. And what if, you, if you're if you asking why does this one work, it could be because the uh, split rings are different or the, the the one hook is just a little bit off on the mold or like, I you mean. you got to give our, our audience better than that. Come on. You got something. Come on. Oh, well, as far as action goes, I've already said it's it's no, it's a side, a kick to the side. Right. And, and the, the when you like, I mean, if things are going slow in the boat, right, and, and we're trolling and, you know, you got the music going and, and uh, I, I always like to just go back, grab a rod and give her a couple of rips, right, just to see. Um, but. You know, hmm. it's that uh, it's that change. It'd be like um, since we're in a tackle store here, um, chatter baits like the uh, Evergreen uh, Jackhammer. I don't know anybody's run jackhammers before. That thing it doesn't do the regular chatter bait thing. It goes like this and boom, and then boom, and it does the same thing. What you guys are talking about, I believe, yeah. is, is you're talking about, right? And that's why that pay, you pay 25, 30 bucks for a chatter bait and it works. And people say, why? That's why that chatter bait works better than the other ones. I guarantee you that. So that's what I figured out. So I guess that's maybe the erraticness of a bait. Yeah. That's what you guys are saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, every, every bait's got a unique action. That's yeah. what it is. You got to like learn your baits and see and what you're confident. In. Like you said, confidence is the biggest thing. I mean, you catch a fish, you'll put it back in. You'll you'll leave that bait there and you'll switch the other one for first. Sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure that's so. true. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else got anything? And my, we carry on. Go the ahead. last thing I'll say about that. Yes. That is why I didn't swim your bait because I have one, right? And if you lose that bait. Oh man, like I mean yeah, my I, sons my sons are like, Dad, how big how heavy is that leader? Like it's a hundred and twenty pound leader. You should it should be okay. And I always tell them if they're using it, if you get that bait snagged, boys you're going swimming, right? So there was there was after I heard your story, I think I said to Peter or Dean, I said, There is no way I'm running that bait. did a small town sheet metal mechanic come to build one of Canada's most iconic fishing lodges? I'm your host Steve Nidzwicki and you'll find out about that and a whole lot more on the Outdoor Journal Radio Network's newest podcast, Diaries of a Lodge Owner. But this podcast will be more than that. Every week on Diaries of a Lodge Owner, I'm going to introduce you to a ton of great people, share their stories of our trials, tribulations and inspirations learn and have plenty of laughs along the way meanwhile we're sitting there bobbing along trying to figure out how to catch a mask and we both decided one day we were going to be on television doing a fishing show my hands get sore a little bit when i'm reeling in all those bass in the summertime but that's might be for more fishing than it was punching you so confidently you said hey pat have you ever eaten a drum Find Diaries of a Lodge Owner now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. We interrupt this program to bring you the much-anticipated bonus code for the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. Uh, this week's code is trolling. That's trolling. T-R-O-L-L-I-N-G, all caps. Just type that in the bonus code section of the contest and receive 100 free entries towards all our current giveaways. For those who haven't entered yet, what the heck are you waiting for? Head on over to fishingcanada.com while you listen to the rest of this episode. Click contests and sign up for all the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. And now, back to the show. That's good. So carrying on before we'll take it, we'll take a couple more questions, but uh, carrying on. So today we wanted to do the large mold portion of the show and we went into the head pond, is that what you call it? Or the Mac yeah, it was the Mac to Quack arm. Mac to Quack yeah. arm, yeah. which is the most gorgeous looking piece of water I think I've ever been into in a long time. And um, and we were, you know, taking on large mouth and, and Ange and Steve, Ange started the day um, way up in the far end. It looked just 
Greece it was so good up there and all that stuff. And then uh, Hans had his emergency, he had to go home and all that. So um, we went back to the spot. And to be honest, and I've talked to everybody, and they said this is a great spot for numbers of largemouth bass. But we had a real hard time today getting numbers of largemouth bass. We got small fish, but we could not do any, you know, we could not get anything going for bigger fish. And I, and uh, it's just one of those days. Flat, calm, you know, the water temperature was 68 to 69 degrees, which is perfect. I love that kind of water temperatures like that. Uh, weeds are still green um, the deeper weeds the shallow pads are perfect looking but we could not yeah. get it going we found like, bait everywhere we found like we, we like we just couldn't get the fish to bite our lures yeah it was you know, yeah 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 it was scanned crazy. everywhere and then i talked to the guys out here including ben uh, um uh, outside and, and and pierre here and they're saying as much as Sometimes just a six inch water drop. So you're the water's dropping here, right? All that is that what's yeah, it happening? Seems like it's what's dropping now. Yeah. Right. So is that just because of the dam where we are or how's that what is So right now the water is dropping down river. I mean the, there's not enough water flowing, I think. Right. And then now when they're flowing the dam, now the dam is going lower and then the down river is just staying steady. Okay. So but a, but a six inch to one foot water depth change can mean the world of difference it can change it can change everything really i mean you can kind of see it when you're scanning one one day you can be at a spot where everybody like all the fish are feeding at that one spot and then tomorrow there's a big change in the water well not even like six inches yeah that's not a big change you'd never notice but, it uh, you showed us that on the shore today you said guys the water's dropped he yeah says, i don't know if that's a bad thing or not but, exactly but yeah. it, it dropped i bet you it dropped a foot didn't it close well, to it we could see it on short it was still fresh on the side yeah so anyway it dropped yeah. overnight it yeah, like, yeah. Like it, were, it was yeah. dropping as we were fishing yeah um, so but uh, um and it, obviously everybody's fished that body of water sitting in this room right like, pretty good is it like a What's a big largemouth out of there? What's a? Uh, my bank cod line over six pounds. Over six pounds. Yeah. Okay. That's a nice largemouth. That's a big largemouth, man. That's right. Wow. wow. Nice. 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 What do you get it on, you know? Not one of your baits? <laughs> it must have been a dice. <laughs> I think it was a dice. Uh, right on, right on. Um, what do you want to do, Dino? What else do you want to talk about here? What do we got? Uh, Nico, do you want to come in and uh, talk about your experience? Peter, if you want to give up your spot. Sounds good. Everybody, let's hear it for Peter. Thank you, guys. Pierre. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Pierre. My friend. So for those of you that have watched the show lately, this is Nick Angelo's grandson. And, uh, and Nick has taken on a role as part of the uh, Fishing Canada team as well. So Steve, uh, Dean, Nick, uh, along with Angie and I, so, so far, I think, right? And uh, Nico, give us your experience on uh, your New Brunswick experience and your sturgeon fishing. Yeah, no, it was, um, it was awesome. I never fished sturgeon before. Right. So that was uh, a really cool experience. And you guys are saying with the circle hooks and not setting the hook, it was like rewriting how to fish for me. I just, I couldn't get the, uh, the, the, the concept of just not setting it and not touching it and not doing anything, just gently picking it up and reeling it in. Like that's the biggest no-no for every other species <laughs> is set the hook, rip it, get it in. It, it, it was total opposite. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell yeah. you, they're, they are possibly the coolest looking fish I think I've ever seen. The fight, how about the fight in that big one? Oh, the fight, the fight was just... It wasn't Wild. a big fish. It wasn't a massive fish. It was, it was probably mid thirties, but it it fought like hell. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was it was intense. Like Dean was, uh, you know, making me aware of the fact they fight that much, and um, I didn't quite believe him. But after that, I definitely, definitely did. And for the audience that's not here, sitting here, and knowing all about the New Brunswick uh, way of catching these sturgeon, how'd you catch it? Yeah. So basically, you um, you get these big old rods and you. It's a dip in worms, so you just get a circle hook, you cover it in worm, like live bait. We were doing two or three per hook, and you just drop it down and wait. You got it, so you got a slide and get to tell that though. We got a sliding weight that it stops. It's like basically like a live bait, regular like, like a Lindy yeah, rig, so the uh, fish can pick up the bait, swim with it, and not feel the weight. But it's a strong weight to hold it in the current yeah, it was right a, place. A, a, an ounce weight, I think. Or? Yeah, something like that. Something oh, like it'll that. be bigger than ounce, I think. But they're they're Pierre big weights, know. Pierre regardless. Would, and, Pierre um, would give us like three ounces at least, I'm sure. But um, and the key to that is is that bait staying in one spot. 
So Nick, being a young guy, being 21 years old, he always, and at first he had, he had to move that worm a thousand times before it was, it was in the right spot for him. So Pierre said, no, no, no. I said, Nick, no, no. And he had to just pull it to feel it. He said, Nick, you're moving it, you're moving it, you're moving it, you won't catch a fish. So Nick finally had to put his hands in his pockets. And just oh, say, absolutely. Okay, okay I'm, not, I'm, ready, I'm ready to fish now. And that's exactly yeah. what happened after that. I, had to, I actually had to end up sitting down on the boat just because like my brain was just keep, kept telling me, just move it, put it out somewhere else, get it in the right position and, and you'll find them and it just was a matter of waiting. Yeah, yeah, It's, yeah. All, it's very similar to carp fishing. It's minus very, the tents and the chairs and, and all that. You just gotta, and the beepers, you're almost, yeah. you're just waiting. It's yeah, the yeah, biggest yeah, yeah, patience yeah. game that you can play for fishing. And that was a, a short nose sturgeon. There's, a, there's yes. two here, Atlantic and short nose. Does anybody out in the audience know the record Short nose sturgeon. I don't know. I'm asking a question. Does anybody know the world record, the, the Canadian record? Uh, uh, what's a big one? What is a. Sure. I don't know the record, but I know it's 60 Up to 60 wow. inches. So that's a big fish. That's, I mean, that would be in a musky world of 60 inches, a 60 pounder, isn't it? Wow, well, yeah. Like, I, I mean, think. absolutely. Something like that. Uh, you're a pound an inch once you get. Uh, and those sturgeon are in the fall. Boldest. Like, yeah. they're thick, right? They're a meaty fish. So, yeah. Uh, that'd be a big one. So, and no uh, and are they known to jump? I, I'm asking, are they? Yes. Yeah, so get everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ours didn't jump. <laughs> Surprisingly. Didn't jump. Yeah, and Surprisingly. it pulled really good. So, came to the surface a lot, three or four times with the fight with the bigger one. But it didn't breach, which apparently is very odd. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else got anything for us here in the, in the question world? Anything. And it doesn't have to be New Brunswick. It can be Fishing Canada related. It can be personal questions and the fishing, not personal, personal. What's the best part about coming to the Maritimes? What's the best time, or what's the best part about coming to the Maritimes to fish? So um, we always have said, Ange and I have always said, that I mean, you guys are all sitting here, but it's the people. This is there's no doubt about it. It's the people. There's the the fishing. It goes without saying. It's it's excellent. But when when you go when you travel across the country, like we have done in our past, I mean, and we never want to offend any other provinces. We we hate to do that or any part of the country and all that. But when you hit the Maritimes, boy, she's a different world. The people, as I think everybody knows here, are just absolutely amazing. The hospitality is ridiculously nice. There's you just it's it's not like like I live in the greater Toronto area, the GTA, and it ain't like there. OK, this the attitude of everybody, the whole friendliness, the, it's it's a, it's another world. So that's to me, that's the best part. Yeah, it, uh, it feels like home, even though it isn't ours. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's wow. the best way I can sum it up. That's a that's a wonderful way to sum it up. And um, I uh, I actually had an experience uh, while we were here and I. Um, uh, one of the bolts on our trailer on the bunk broke and uh, I had to replace it. Dean and Pete went out and they were scouting around and I brought my truck down and that was the trailer. So, you know what? I don't mind. I used to be a sheet metal mechanic. We'll fix this up. No problem. And uh, I got on the phone and I, I needed a grade eight, grade nine bolt uh, because I didn't want to mess around with, you know, a grade five or regular bolt because it's already broke. So I got on the phone with um, Bayview uh, Trucking Parts, I think it's called. And uh, local guys crossed the river. Uh, I drove over there, uh, went in. I talked to the guy at the front desk. Great guy. Set me up with the bolts, no problem. And um, I, had, uh, I took the bolt in and uh, I decided that I should have um, shorter bolts. But um, it was the wrong decision. So I went back in to switch for longer bolts and there was a guy standing at the desk, a worker. He turned around and it was uh, a very good high school friend of mine from back in Shelburne, Ontario. And Shelburne, Ontario, like, I mean, it's a town of 3,500, Kevin Giroux. And uh, he moved to New Brunswick three years ago. I didn't even know. I, as far as I knew, he was kicking around Shelburne and you know how you get separated from your high school friends, but they're still great friends. And uh, I give him a big hug and, he, and, and, I, and I asked him, I said, Kev, what's it like to live out here? He said, Steve, I'm gonna be honest with you. There is not enough money that anybody could pay me to go back to Shelburne. I miss my buddies, but he said, it's like when we grew up. 
It's it, everybody is is so friendly. He said, if you if you pull over on the side of the highway, the first six people that drive by you stop to see if you're okay. It's not like that back home anymore. Dude. It's like it's like that here. And uh, what you have here is uh, it's a beautiful thing. Our friend Ben Wu, I'm sure Ben, you can give me just a thumbs up because that's pretty much the story, isn't it? You've came from. It's a one-way ticket, Ben said. I mean, he loves it here, yeah. and he, I mean, he won't be going back, I'm sure of it. So I He said he, earlier he would not. He, he would trade suburbia for this 10 times every day. <laughs> 10 times every day. That's nice. Well, Ben's pretty spoiled, right? You know, he, he's had a good life. <laughs> Any other questions by anybody? Here we go. Could be. Right, we heard about that one. So the, yeah. the question is for the listening audience is that uh, there's a couple of lakes in, in New Brunswick here. One had largemouth in it. The other had has or had smallmouth in it. And once discovered um, somebody, I don't know, is it the DFO or who is it that wants, that wants the eradication of these fish? Or is it just... Pardon? Camp owners, DFOs, okay. So, um, and then you're, the question also went back to the Black Bass Championship being being held here. So from what we've heard from the Black Bass Championship being held here, um, I believe Chris might be able to help me on this, that they're, they, they're going to allow largemouth. Are they going to allow largemouth into this event? Do you know? Okay, so... Right. So we're what we've been told is that they're trying to get a an extension or something for largemouth to be weighed in this event. However, the, you have to literally tell the officials the exact areas that you caught them in, the exact location that you caught them in, so that they can take these individual fish and put them back in that same water, in the largemouth water. So they won't be transferred into the main part of here. Now, they're probably already here. I'm going to guess that, I mean, with the little arms that are having largemouth in them, that they're going to eventually make their way and trickle their way through everywhere, I would think. But, but I think in order to, for the tournament's sake and the professionalism of it all, they're going to say, okay, we might allow a largemouth, and then if we do, they are going to be transferred back. Is that going to be successful? Well, hopefully the, the team could do that 100%, right? And I think they could, you know, if they really keep a good track of it. I don't know how many people will will fish for largemouth versus smallmouth. I mean, if they can get on a good pattern, um, that might be thinking, you know, you've got some really good anglers coming up here for that, right? There's some, th those, uh, yeah, well, then the American guys, I mean, Wheeler uh, is coming up here, the best, you know, rated bass angler in the world right now. So, uh, Scotty Martin, all those guys, so. Hammer too, right? You just Jet won the Bassmaster. Bass Master. Hammer. Master yeah. classic. Yeah, yeah, so there, there's some great anglers coming up. They'll probably, they'll want to fish largemouth, but they're probably gonna they're probably gonna see so many how many smallmouth are out here. And you got Gussie, of course, Gussie and Cooper Gallant that are coming up too. So um, I have a feeling Gussie and Cooper Gallant will not be worried about largemouth. I got a feeling they'll be doing the smallmouth thing and trying to you know trying to get their best sack out of that. But um, it's it's a shame, but it, it's important. And we've had in working with New uh, New Brunswick, and that it's important to note that our goal on this trip. If we get our largemouth bass segment done, is that they're a great sport fish. They are established here, but do not move that fish anywhere. We we want to tell the world that, and it's I mean for New Brunswick, it's it's a very important thing. You just you don't because the 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 tendency is for they're just a great fish that can live and thrive in so many different types of waters that. Hey, I'd like to have those on my lake. That'd be awesome on my lake. You know what I mean? It's a, and it's so easy to put six in your live well, five in your live well. I don't know if there's a limit here or not, but if there is, you put them in your live well, and you got two guys. You put a dozen fish into your lake, and you do that ten times in a year, and all of a sudden you got a great population of large well bass. Well, that's highly illegal, and it's not smart to do, no matter what. Like it's just not. You just you are changing the ecosystem of that body of water. Uh, as much as I love, large my, my favorite fish, but you, you know, I just say, okay, I fish where they are. I'm not going to move them where they're not. You know, you have to, and it's highly illegal too. It's illegal. It's immoral. It's just everything about it is not right. You know what I mean? So hopefully, um, I don't like the idea of eradicating them from a lake like that. If they're in a lake, 
let them be. Let them, you know, I don't know how they got there. Who knows how they got there? Maybe it was illegal or that, but I mean, if when they start doing that poisoning, like they did with the smallmouth out here like that, boy, that raised a lot of shit in the, in the world. Right. So it was, it wasn't pretty. Yeah. We could, we could just, uh, yeah, it was not a it's, good thing. It's, so. um, and I don't think that, uh, and to, to kind of, uh, throw my two cents in and, and answer your question. Um, as far as the large mouth goes with this tournament, the better um, uh, that you can represent the species and the safer that you can represent the species, um, the better chance of having them left where they are will be. Um, if you can prove that they bring money to the town, um, then they become valuable. Um, I shot a show with Angelo in 2019 back before, um, they, uh, when they were killing muskie, when they would, uh, get caught in the Mactaquack dam, um, um, trap and, uh, they would lift all of the native species, but the muskies, they didn't get let back, go down below the dam. They were disposed of. And, um, again, because of all of you, um, and, and showing people that, you know, muskies aren't really the, the enemy here. You can make a lot of money in the economy with muskies. Um, that's very important. And, and that can be important with bass. But having said that, when you move those bass, um, number one, like Pete said, they're illegal, da, da, da. We all know that. But the other thing is our tax paying dollars go and are spent on all of the research and all of the other e eradication programs and the programs to prevent the spread. So really, if you're doing that, you're just costing us taxpayers money, right? Uh, if they're here, they're here. And I think that, um, I think that they're ready to embrace that fact because it honestly, I think it's just too hard to, to actually get rid of them. Um, so you embrace it, right? But it's important to, uh, to embrace what we have, but, but follow the rules. No, yeah. I was going to read this because it was a perfect segue. And we have a, a, one of our sponsors is the Invasive Species Center, and, but we're not going to do it right now. Yeah, yeah. Do it now? Okay. So this is what we do in our podcasts all the time. We, instead of uh, commercials, we do live little uh, things. And this is uh, it's actually, that's why I want to read this, is because it's, uh, it's going on in other uh, types of things. So if you, I'll do a line, you do a line, sort of thing like that, if you but want. I don't have my glasses, but oh, I'll do my shit. best. I, I'll do, I can read it all. So here's the, here's the way this thing is, is to be read. Uh, the humble goldfish, everyone's favorite aquatic pet. Small, easy to care for, what's not to love? You want to try it? Even the cat may be. Yeah, I'll hold it up for you. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And you're going to have to tell me what this word is here. That's mesmerized, my friend. Oh, mesmerized. I can read it all. Even the you cat may be mesmerized by the color <laughs> and movements of your aquarium friends. Goldfish are great at home, but don't let them loose. So this is an ongoing thing, obviously. It's exactly what we're talking about. It's a perfect question right now. It's a perfect segue. Releasing goldfish or other domestic aquatic pets or pets or plants into natural environments is harmful to both your pet and the planet. Goldfish disrupt ecosystems by outcompeting native species species for food and resources in degraded habitats. They continue to LJ blooms, kill aquatic wildlife, pass viruses and diseases contracted in aquariums to, to wild fish. They can even eat up, uh, they can even live up to 40 years and be as big as a football. Uh, anglers, this is where you come in when you find goldfish at your local fishing spot. Bye bye, Stevie. Uh, report them to the Invading oh, Species Hotline, or uh, eddmaps.com. Rem uh, remember to never dump your live bait. This is one, I'm not sure, I'm sure this is New Brunswick, but uh, I'm going to hope it's New Brunswick. Never, never to dump your live bait into the water and risk spreading other aquatic invaders. Keep our lakes free from invaders and don't let it loose. So the another thing in Ontario... Uh, a rule. I'm. I'm going to ask you guys if this is the rule out there. Because you you can't empty your bait bucket with it. Like we have to be 30 feet up on land before we can empty our bait bucket. I think it's 30 feet or 30 yards or something like that. Is that a law here? Does anybody know? You can't sell. There you go. Wow. You can't sell live minnows in New Brunswick. It's illegal. Okay, so you trap them from that watershed. You have to use them in the in the lake that you trap the watershed that you trap them in. You can't you can't right. You can't take it from here, thirty five miles away, and fish the lakes like that. Well, that's good. It's that's exactly what we're at what you're now. saying with largemouth, right? Uh, sorry. 
No That's transport of any, any live uh, fish. Within New Brunswick, so on tidal waters. So all non-tidal waters, that minnow had to come from that body of water. <laughs> so you can't, you can't basically. You have to use minnows from the lake that you caught them in the tidal waters. You're saying you can, can you use, use so them? So long in as any, they're caught in New Brunswick. Caught in New Brunswick. Right. So the border, and that's another thing, but people that are listening might not realize that uh, New Brunswick and Maine uh, border each other like that. And you can fish. There are lakes that split that are split on both U.S. and Canadian side. And you can use live bait on those, what they're saying is live bait on those lakes, as long as it's from that, that lake, basically. And all that. So you're, basically, your live bait rules are much further ahead than ours. Our, ours are just getting to yours now. Ontario, I'm talking about now. We're just getting to that point now because we're having so many rules come out in that sense of that bait bucket. You can't empty that. Here's another one for you. <laughs> Here's a weird one for you guys. We we never knew this. Ant and I never knew this, and I don't even think Steve knew this until we brought it up to him. When we fillet our fish, we can't throw the carcasses into the lake. It's illegal to throw the fish carcasses into the lake. We always thought, hey, the turtles are going to get that. Everybody's going to, this is great for the environment. And no, it's not going to stink, anybody like that. Highly illegal, apparently. So is it illegal here? Does anybody know? You need to take the carcass home with you. Right. You have to have the carcass with you. You can clean it anywhere as long as you have all the parts with you and bring it home and dispose of it. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have to have a head-to-tail measurement on that because most fish here are, are they're, they're under some kind of regulation of length, right? Of length regu- regulation. Slots. Yeah, slots. And like, so that's the only way they can do it, yeah. Because, again, in Ontario, we don't have to do that if there's no... So if there's a slot, we'd have to, but there's some places, well, I guess now the most, well, the bass, for instance, bass, there's no slot, there's no sizes, but you still, if you fillet that fish, you have to keep a one inch square of, of skin on that for identification, sort of thing like that. But I, I don't know if that's even done around here at all, but. Well, I mean, it makes sense that they do that here because Ben was saying earlier that uh, for stripers specifically, you can only keep them from what? It's uh, 26 to 38? 36. 26 to 36? Give or take, give yeah. or take, and yeah, um, a, there's no way you'd be able to verify exactly. that if you uh, didn't have the whole fish. If, yeah, so I'm assuming most people clean the fish at home. Is that the easiest way you catch them and bring them home and clean them? It, make, it makes the most sense, right? Obviously, it's just the fish guts. Hey, Dean, fish guts. Quick, oh, quick nope. story. I, <laughs> I, 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 we went on a trip. Ange and I went on a trip one time. Oh shoot! And uh, Monique phoned Ange and said. Uh, my God, an animal died in the, in the office. Something, something happened, an animal died in the office. Long story short, Dean went out into the garage. I parked my truck in the garage and I had a pike, oh. a, a pike carcass in the back of my truck that I was gonna throw in the garbage bin and I forgot. It was in the garage like this he, for days upon days. You're, you're forgetting I spent about three days searching for uh. said carcass. I thought it was a big dead rat. I checked every square inch of that office for two or three days. I apologize, until Pete boys. Finally, uh, we discovered his zombie pike. <laughs> That thing stunk. Oh my God. Oh, and, then, and when Ange told me, he says, Guess what you let? What you did? And I said, Oh, no, what I do? And he said, Monique is going to kill you when I get back. So but I survived. Um, any other goodies before we, uh, we get going? Anybody got anything else? Benny? What have you noticed about the bass patterns? Okay, so Ben's question is What have we noticed about the smallmouth bass patterns uh, being different from Ontario, comparison to Ontario in New Brunswick here, because the bait is different, uh, i.e., there's no gobies out here. They don't eat quite the same. They have Gasparo out here, which is a little alewife, or a, an alewife, maybe not a little alewife, but a type of alewife, and they have different food base. So um, I can't, you know what, Ben, I haven't, I haven't fished these enough to, to really di- dive that deep into them because the ones we're catching, we're doing the exact same thing as we do back home, right? The honest Ned rigs. I was throwing a crankbait, a square bell crankbait the other day. They were crushing it. Like, you know, they, they were, were all the same. They were in love with that stuff. square bell. Yeah. And, and uh, Yosery, by the way. And um, they, yeah, so I don't know if the bait, well, I think the smallmouth seems to be the same t- attitude. Um, I would probably, you people, or Ben for sure, being from 
Quebec and from here, they might, with the different uh, goby fish and St. Lawrence River and all that, you might have a more of, of a, a thought on that, but I don't really notice any difference in the, in the way we have to catch them. And they them. were relating to all of the same types of structures, structures that we the would ones, The ones that we fish. saw on LiveScope were doing the same stuff down there in between the humps and stuff like that, so I don't know if there's a difference or not. Do you, have you noticed a difference? Yeah? Okay, so I see Ben's got, Ben had made a great point here. You won't find them deep out in the channel on 37 foot because in the St. Lawrence River, and in, in particular Lake St. Francis, you will. We'll, so you'll see a lot of them in there like that, and they're big ones, and they school up down there, and they just sit there and wait. I don't know if they're feeding or waiting or what they're doing. I mean, they're, when they're that deep, it's usually later in the year, I'm assuming, right? It's not, no? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gobies so. are a deep, uh, a deep water forage, are they not? Gobies are an everywhere forage, really. Yeah. They're on the bottom, basically. There's so many gobies in that in that system; it's ridiculous. So, that's another bad one you don't want in this system, by the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Could you say though that as on a on a basic level, though, the smallmouth fishing, no matter where you are, is going to be smallmouth fishing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right? I would say so. I mean, and when they, you were, when you were throwing fight. at them. They fight the same. They fight the same. They they're are rippers the here. Like they live in current. So they, if they live in current like this, they're going to be strong fish and they're lean here. So they're definitely strong fighters. They're lean because they're fighting current all the time. The exception of that is the, is the goby eaters that are fat and still fighting current and, and pull, pull. Do you have some bad ones? Yeah. Okay. The ones that are eating crawdad, Ben said, there's get some crawdad uh, eating fish. They get some pretty fat too. The ones we were getting were pretty lean, but just in a, in a sense of, fast way like that so I, I i don't know that i could see a difference ben but uh it's a great question because uh, i'm gonna i'll talk to you after about it <laughs> i'm sure you got a few little insights for me <laughs> anything else what about the young couple young lads there you guys have some kind of questions what what's the best bait to use for bass so you're looking at smallmouth <laughs> bass i'm assuming right that's a great that is a fantastic question i'll tell you the baits we were using the other day and, and we were using um, square bill crankbaits. We used a, a Yozuri square, square bill crankbait, and they were really hitting that because you can work up from really shallow to down about six feet deep. Um, and we were using jerk baits. They were hitting jerk baits, suspending jerk baits, which you see on the wall here. A lot of them like that. They work fantastic for them too. And the other thing I was throwing, and I was just throwing, if I, if I couldn't get them on the hard baits, I threw a Ned rig. The Ned rig is like, it's money. And Andy. I'll tell you what, it's money on largemouth too. People don't throw it on largemouth because it's too finessey. You know, nobody wants to throw that little stuff on his eight pound test line. I've got more big bass lately on a Ned rig than anything. So to me, that's, I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. No, that's uh, you're pretty bang on. Those would be the best. Those would be my top three. Like, sure. I mean, and the, the classic that I, uh, that I still carry and, uh, and uh, you, you don't hear people talk about it as often, but for smallies, I know where you're going. Yeah, you can't beat a tube, tube. jig. Yeah, tube yeah, jig. Yeah, a good. tube man. It's uh, they're they're great too. So yeah. uh, give the tube its due. Yep, yep, true enough. And uh, you know, if my if my granddad was here, he'd uh, he'd also throw drop shot in, into that. But yeah, that's drop shot. Yeah, for sure. Exactly, a little three for inch, sure. three or four inch middle shad, sort of plastic like that. Absolutely. So, but I mean, smallmouth are aggressive fish, right? So they, they'll hit from top water to dig deep, everything down below. So um, you just got to kind of find, find your little niche, find your favorite, and, and, and go for it like that. But I will say one of the biggest smallmouth I ever got was on a top water popper, and that is, that is some of the most fun you'll ever have. So if you have the opportunity to catch one on top water on just nice still, go for it. Yeah, yeah. and don't use fluorocarbon line. That's the best tip you're going to get because you're going to say, what the hell is going on with my bait? And you're not going to be. <laughs> That's it. That's a great point. You see the bite, just count to two or three. Yeah. One elephant, two elephant, boom, and then hit them because yeah. it makes a big difference. Just like Nick with hooks. Just like hook sturgeon set. fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't well, you, you got one, Have bud? a little delayed reaction. New York hat? No, you're good? Okay, no questions at all. Any fishing questions, any like that? No? Okay. I'm not going to pressure like that. Um, okay, boys, I don't know. Anything else you guys got? Unless anyone wants to know how, you know, a little more behind the scenes on how the show is made itself or anything, then if not. We're good. We're good. 
Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, folks. Thanks so much for coming over, over tonight to the to the Minnow Tackle Shop. And uh, for everybody listening, the, this is another On the Road uh, podcast from the, uh, the Outdoor Journal Radio Network. Uh, Steve, thank you. Nick, thank you. Thank and you. Pierre, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And everybody else, thank you very much for coming. Take care. This episode of Outdoor Journal Radio has been brought to you in part by the Invasive Species Center, protecting Canada's land and water from invasive species, and SAIL, the ultimate destination for your outdoor adventures.